the largest one among natural numbers that are less than log of 3 base 2 times log of 4 base 3 times log of 5 base 4 all the way to log of 2020 base 2019 is blank. The key to solving this problem is the following identity. If you have a number p and q, you have log of q base p. This can also be expressed as the log of q, that is this number here, base some number b all over log of p. So this p becomes the number here, and again base b. So the b's are the same, the bases are the same, it doesn't matter what the base is. And your Q goes here, your P goes here. Now we have a few restrictions. First is that we we want B, P, and Q to be positive numbers. We don't want them to be zero or less because if it's less than zero, then we don't know how to define log. And when it's zero, we don't also know how to define log when it's zero. So we want them to be greater than zero. And we have an additional restriction that b and p should not be equal to 1 because if b and p were 1 then 1 would be the base and 1 to any number would always be 1 so we can't get q if q is not 1 so we, we, we'd want to restrict b and p to be not 1 okay but any anything else is fine anything that is not 1 and anything that is positive so just an example we have this expression log of 2 to the 100 base 2 so right off the bat we know that because this is base 2 then the answer to this would be 100 right the 2 here and the 2 here sort of cancels each other but if we use this identity we can also arrive at the same conclusion so this expression now becomes log of 2 to the 100 and now the base here Let's assume this to be the natural logarithm, that is base e. And so this bit here goes here, and the base here goes here. Now the properties of logarithms allow us to, to move the exponent outside. So the 100 goes here, and we're left with log 2 inside. We have log 2 divided by log 2, and they cancel, and we're left with, again, 100. So it's the same as just canceling the basis and this argument here. And again, you notice that if we had b, let's say 1, so we will have a problem here, a problem here because 1 raised to any number does, never, does not become 2 at all. So we don't want b and p to be 1. Now let's use the identity that we've learned in the previous slide to actually solve the problem. We begin by defining the given as the number L. So this is just for convenience. Now if we use the identity, we can expand these terms, the individual terms, and we get the following. Log of 3 base 2 now becomes this fraction, log of 3 divided by log of 2. And again, the bases here do not matter because anything, any number would work except those that are restricted in the previous slide. So just for this solution, let's say that the base is E or the natural logarithm. So this log here is the natural logarithm of 3 and natural logarithm of 2. Now we do that for the next factor. We get log of 4 over log of, log of 3. And we do that for all the terms. and then the last term would be log of 2020 over log of 2019. Now we notice that when written this way, this bit here cancels with this bit. This bit cancels with this bit, and that continues until log of 2019. So we are left with two terms, this bit and this bit. And so our expression now becomes this one here. And again, we use the identity to reduce it to the following expression. And we put the base, this denominator now becomes the base here. And this one goes here. And then we can write this. This is equivalent to this expression, which is 2 
the base 2 to the L exponent equals 2020. And now we notice the following. We notice that 2 to the 10 is 1024, 1024. Then we have 2 to the L is 2020. And 2 to the 11 is actually 2048. So 2020 falls between 2 to the 10 and 2 to the 11. And so we can say that actually L falls between 10 and 11. And that's because the the logarithmic and the exponential function are both monotonic and increasing, which means that the pattern of it increasing from 10 to L, L to 11 is preserved. And so we can just get the logarithm of, of both sides and, and we can still arrive at this conclusion. So the answer, the natural number that we're looking for is the number 10. Let f of x equal 1 plus 1 over x minus 1, where x is not equal to 1. This condition is to make sure that we do not have 0 as a denominator here. The solution of the equation f of f of x equals f of x is x equals blank and blank. So it's looking for two solutions to this equation. To solve this problem, we have to notice the following. First is that the right-hand side of this equation, so this is the equation we want to solve, the right-hand side of that is simply 1 plus 1 over x minus 1, f of x. And the left-hand side is simply the composition of f by itself. So we replace the x here with f of x. And so the question is, what is x when these two expressions are equal? So let's first just rewrite the right-hand side, which is just f of x. And again, that's just 1 plus 1 over x minus 1. Now we rewrite the left-hand side, which is f of f of x. And we see that it's just this expression where the x here was replaced by the f of x in here. And now, because we want to simplify this, we want to replace this expression, this f of x, by this expression. That way we will be left with an expression that contains x. And that's what we did here. We just replaced the f of x with its value in here. Now we notice that we can cancel the ones in here and in here. And so we're left with this expression. We notice that this bit here is just actually the reciprocal of, a recip of the reciprocal of x minus 1. So we can just move the x minus 1 to the numerator. And now we have this expression. We have f of f of x, which is what we needed. And this part of the expression just becomes x minus 1. And this one is retained. And again, we can do a cancellation of this one and this one. And now we're left with just x. So what this means is that actually this side of the equation is just x. And this side of the equation is this expression here. That is 1 plus 1 over x minus 1. And so the equation we want to solve is the following. x, which is the left-hand side in here, equals 1 plus 1 over x minus 1, which is this. And to simplify this further, to, make, to, to get to a form that is good, let us move the 1 here to the other side. And we do that by subtracting 1 from both sides, and we get x minus 1 on this side, and we are left with this expression from this side. And then we multiply both sides by this expression, x minus 1. And so the left side now becomes x minus 1 squared, and the right side is just 1. And this is a good form, because here we can just get the square root of both sides. And so if we do that, we get x minus 1 on this side. That's the square root of x minus 1 squared. And on this side, the right side, we get plus minus 1. So that's the square root of 
one. And we just move this one here to the other side by adding one to both sides. And we get x equals plus minus one. And x equals one plus one, so that's the plus bit, is just two. And x equals one minus one is just zero. Let a and b be real numbers with b greater than or equal to zero. When the equation x to the fourth plus ax squared plus b equals zero has exactly two real solutions, the minimum value of a plus 2b is blank, and the maximum value of the ceiling of a minus b is blank. Here, the ceiling of r denotes the smallest integer that is larger than or equal to the real number r. For this problem, it's not immediately obvious how we are going to go and tackle the solution. So it is always helpful for these kinds of problem to write down first what we know, and that will help us find a probable possible path towards the solution. So again, let's write down the things that we know. First, we know that b should be greater than or equal to zero. In other words, b must be non-negative, and we know this from the problem statement. We also know that this equation here has exactly two real solutions. And this language means that this equation here has exactly two solutions and that both of them are real. So normally for a for an equation of degree four, we would have four solutions. We would have four roots of this left hand side. But for this case, in this case, the problem states that there are exactly two solutions and that those solutions are real numbers. And so what that means is that some of the solutions, one at least one of them, repeats, has a multiplicity that is greater than one. The third bit is knowable from the equation that's given. So if we think of this equation as a quadratic equation, quadratic in x squared, then we can solve x squared using the quadratic formula. If you remember, that, that is simply x squared, that is the variable. So here, think of x squared as the variable here. So that's x, here we have x squared squared, here we have a x squared, and here we have b. And so from the quadratic formula, we get x squared equals the negative of the coefficient here, so that's negative a, plus minus the square root of the square of the coefficient here, and so that's a squared minus four times the coefficient here, which is just one, times the coefficient here, which is b, and, and that's why we get this term here. And now take all of these and divide it by two times the coefficient here, which is just one. And so we get this expression for x squared. Now, we can get the expression for x from three. And so, we just get the square root of both sides, and now we obtain the value for x as the plus, the positive or negative of this, of the square root of this entire expression. And notice that this is the general form of the solution of this, of this equation here. And we have four, in fact, we have one, two here, and then again, the positive and the negative of each of those. So we have four solutions here if we're looking at this one here. Now we said that this expression here tells us there are four solutions, right? Plus minus here and the plus minus the positive and negative of the square root of those, of each of those. And that leads us to thinking about the condition two here because it says two real solutions. And so we want to make this into just actually two solutions. And how do we do that? So think about what the possible values of the discriminant here are. So a squared minus 4b. 
a squared minus 4b, if, if it is negative, then what we have is, a neg is, is the square root of a negative number. And that means it's a complex number. Now, if it's a complex number, the square root of that would also be a complex number. And so we will be violating this second condition that says that the solutions are real solutions. And so this expression here cannot be negative. Now, what if it's positive? So if, the, if this expression here is positive, then we have a real square root. And so that we have a positive of that real square root and a negative of that real square root. And now we, we have to take the positive and the negative of the entire thing. And that means we will have four solutions. The, pos the square root of the positive square root here. So we get plus and minus of that. And then we, get, we also get the plus and minus of the square root when this is negative here. So four solutions out there. And again, that's in violation of this second condition. So a negative value for this is not possible. A positive value of this is also not possible. And so we're left with the value here that is zero, because if this is zero, then this bit here is gone and we are just left with plus minus the square root of negative a over two. And so we use that condition, a squared minus four b must be zero, and now we can get a relationship between a and b and that is that a equals the positive or negative square root of b times 2. and we go further now we know that for a squared minus 4b must be 0 then we can just substitute 0 here and we obtain x equals the positive or negative of the square root of negative a over 2. and furthermore just from this, we also know that a must be a negative number. Why? Because if a were 0, that means that x equals 0. But we are told that x should have two solutions, and therefore a cannot be 0. Right? Because if, if a were just 0, then we only have one solution. And also a cannot be positive, because if a is positive, then negative a is negative and now we're going to get the square root of a negative number and now we will have complex solutions and therefore we will be violating again this condition too and so a could only be negative because the negative of a negative number is positive and so we don't have a problem getting the square root of that but now that we know that a must be negative we will also have a new a, a known value for a here that means a must be the negative square root of b times 2 because we know that a is negative and so the positive branch of this can now be ignored now we add the condition that we just found so here we add we added number 5 which is a equals the negative of 2 times square root of b and this must be less than 0 and also because we we already know the value of this to be 0 here we added this we now know that x is the negative of the square root of negative a over 2 but now we might be ready to start looking at what we're looking for so we're looking for the minimum, for the first half is looking for the minimum of a plus 2b. And if we look at this fifth condition here, if we actually add 2b to both sides, it looks like we might be able to get something. So let's do that. For convenience, let us first define a variable m and let this be the minimum of a plus 2b. In other words, we're looking for m. And now, if we first look at a plus 2b, we can use 5, and we add 2b to both sides, we get this. And this is starting to look like the expression of a parabola, where this left side here is y, and square root of b is the x. 
And so if we just try to complete this square, well, before that, let's try to factor out the two here. So we get this, then we complete this square inside. And so we add one fourth and subtract one fourth so that that does not change the value of this expression. And now we know that these first three terms, these terms comprise a perfect square. And so we, in fact, we, we move this out of the quantity symbol. And so we get two times the perfect square here that is from this bit here. And moving this outside, we get two times negative one fourth. And so we get negative one half out there. And then we notice that in fact, this looks like a parabola. And that's a parabola with a positive coefficient. And so that's, that opens upwards, right? Like that. And also for this parabola, we know that the vertex would be one half and the minimum is negative one half. And that's from here. Therefore, and also for this parabola, we know that the horizontal axis is the square root of B. That's this one. And the vertical axis is the left hand side, which is A plus 2B. So we can now know the minimum value of A plus 2B. In other words, we can now know M. And that is at this vertex. And that is negative one half, this bit here. And if that's negative one half, we, all, we can also know what is B. So B is, so we start with the square root of B, which is negative, uh, which is positive one half. And so if we square that, we get B, which is one fourth. And then we can now get A by using number five here. So it's negative two times the square root of B and the square root of B again is, is just one half. So negative two times one half is negative one. And so that's A. And we still have to make sure that these things, that these values we obtained do not in any way contradict any of the conditions here. Now, if you look at B, it's, it's one fourth, so it's okay. If you look at A, that's negative, and so this is also okay, and so this is also okay. Now, the next part is to check. Check the values of X that we obtain, and we try to substitute it in the, in the equation and see if it satisfies the equation. So let's do that here. So we, we start with this bit, which is what we had from, from the previous slide. Then we use four because this is uh, where we can find the actual X values, the solutions. And so we get, if we plug in these values here, we get X equals plus minus the square root of one half. And if we plug in this value of X, to the given equation, the equation, the equation should check out. Okay. And true enough, you get zero on this side because this is square root of one half. And then you square it, that's one half and you square it again. So that's one fourth. So one fourth plus one fourth, you get one half. And here you have square root of one half. Here you have square root of one half squared. So that's one half already. So negative one half and you have one fourth minus one half plus one fourth. So that's a zero on the other side. And so it looks like that this solution does check out. And so we can say that the minimum of a plus two B that is our lowercase m is in fact negative one half. So that's our answer. Now let's think of the second half of the problem. So again, like what we did for the first half, we're going to use this condition here. And what we're going to do, because we're looking at a minus b out here, we're going to subtract b from both sides of the equation of, of the equation here at number five. And so before we do that, let's first define m to be the maximum of a minus b. And we notice that m here 
is not what we're looking for because here we have a maximum of the ceiling of a minus b so that's what we're looking for ultimately but here in the solution we'll first look at the maximum of just a minus b and we define that to be m so again we use 5 and we subtract b from both sides and we get this and again this looks like a parabola to me and so we factor out the negative bit and now here we just need to add 1 here to complete this square so that looks like this and this first part here is a complete is a perfect square and so we obtain this again this is a parabola in square root of b and so this time this is actually opening downwards right because the negative there is a negative sign in here and for this kind of parabola we know that what this means is that the vertex is at negative one and that the maximum value is one so we'll be tempted to say that in fact m here could be this one however we have a we, we we're going to check again and, and see if it's consistent with all the other conditions that we have here and so if m equals one and therefore the square root of b is negative one at that bit right here so it's negative one now that already looks like it's a problem because the square the principal root of b should be positive but let's go on how do we obtain b so we square both sides of this this and this and we obtain b out here and we see that b equals 1 and that's not a problem because it's consistent with this uh, condition here in number 1 and then if we use that and use number 5 here we see that a equals 2 but wait a minute 2 is not greater is not less than zero right so the way we obtain two is we substitute for square root of b we substitute negative one there so negative one here goes to negative one here square root of b so negative two times negative one is positive two and that's how we got a equals two but again this is greater than zero it's not consistent with number five here because this should be less than zero and in fact you will see that if you substitute it here you will see that you will get a complex number for x and again that's not consistent with 2 so we need to draw and see what's going on so let's try to draw this parabola that we had here here we just draw the parabola that we got from the previous slide and this is what we get and just as expected the vertex is at negative 1 1 and if we recall we were testing if m if the maximum of a minus b is in fact one and it would have been if we considered the entire parabola however if it were one then the square root of b will be negative one this bit here and so the value of b would be positive one and your a and our a here is equal to the negative of two times the square root of b which is negative one and so we get 2 which is greater than 0 however we have established that a must be negative must be less than 0 and the way to do that is to have b positive because if b is 0 imagine if b is, if is 0 then a would be 0 so that's in violation of condition 5 because condition 5 says a should be less than 0 a should be negative and the same is true if b were positive or rather were b, if b were negative or imagine if b were negative just like here where b is negative one when you multiply that with negative two what you get is a positive number just like this and that's greater than zero and again that's in violation of condition five because a according to condition five must be less and not greater than zero so condition five says it should be less than zero a and again that means that 
our b here, square root of b must be, in fact, square root of b must be greater than 0. Okay? And what that means for a plot is that this bit here, all this bit from here to here, including at 0, these are all not viable options for our b. And so we don't want that. We don't want this portion of the graph that's colored purple. That's not part of the solution because that's where b is in fact less than zero like this bit. When in fact, according to condition five, we, we need b or square root of b greater than zero. It's only this bit. And just by looking at this graph, we see immediately that the maximum of this, the maximum value could be here, right? But zero, zero is not part of the solution, right? Because we want a and square root of b to be greater than zero. It cannot be zero, zero. So it's somewhere just above zero, zero, okay? And so if you get the ceiling function, the ceiling function again means just to round up whatever you got. So if you have something here, for example, that would be near zero, maybe 0 0.1, if you round that, or rather negative 0.1, because we're, we're looking at uh, a minus b here, if you just apply a ceiling function, it's going to go to the closest integer above it. So it's going to go to 0. So we can say that there's no maximum, because again, 0, 0 is not included. And we, we can say that a minus b is definitely less than 0. It's here, below, below this, this axis here. And so if it's less than 0, how, you can make it as close to zero as long as it's below zero. And if you get the ceiling function of that, you're going to round it up to zero. Okay, Any value here between negative one and zero, if you round it up, if you get the ceiling function that's rounding it up, you round it up to zero. And of course, the maximum of that would be just zero as well. Now let's derive analytically what we've shown graphically in the previous slide. So we start with the first condition here, which is b is greater than or equal to zero. And then notice that we're after a minus b, and so we'll need a negative sign here, and we do that by multiplying both sides by negative one. And we obtain this inequality here. We just flip the inequality and we get a negative here. And now we just need to add a to both sides and we obtain this. And notice that we have an additional inequality here which says a is less than zero. And this is just from the fifth condition here. It asserts that a must be a negative number. And so a minus b must be a negative number. It cannot be zero. It cannot be greater than zero. It has to be a negative number. And if we write that in terms of b, again, we just replace a here with the value here in terms of b. We just put it here. And it tells us the same thing, that a minus b must be a negative number. And what that means is that we, we cannot have a maximum because a minus b can be brought as close to 0 as we want. It could be negative 0.1. It could be negative 0.01. It can be negative point, then a million zeros, then one, but it can never be zero. So strictly speaking, we do not have a maximum for a minus b. Now, even if we do not have a single maximum for a minus b, what we can say, though, is that the largest values that are permissible for a minus b would have to fall in the following range. It should be greater than negative 1, but less than 0, right? So these are the largest possible values. Now what we can do is we can actually take the ceiling function because the ceiling function is like a round up function. So you take a number, you round it up to the closest integer. And so if you round up 0, that would still be 0. That's the closest integer. Now, if you have a number, any number that falls between negative 1 and 0, how would you round it up? So it would, it would have to be the next integer, 
that's that's above it, that's greater than it. And so if you round up a number, any number between negative one and zero, that would be just zero, right? And so that's why we can say that the the ceiling function of a minus b is zero. And because the largest values of a minus b fall in this range, we know that the maximum of those rounded up values would also be zero, right? Because if you have, for example, another value that's less than negative one, then when you round it up, that will be negative one. And negative one is certainly less than zero. And that's why we can say that the maximum of the ceiling function, again, the ceiling function is the round up function, round it up to the next integer. The maximum of that would have to be zero because of this. The division of a polynomial function f of x by x minus 1 squared gives the remainder of x plus 1. And that by x squared gives the remainder 2x plus 3. Thus, the remainder of the division of f of x by x squared times x minus 1 is ax squared plus bx plus c. Now we need to find a, b, and c. As is usually the case, it would be best to first write down what we know. And the first condition given in the problem is that f of x, when divided by x minus 1 squared, gives a remainder of x plus 1. So it's written this way. So f of x, and then there's some quotient. We don't have to know this function, but we just write it down as x sub 1, or rather q sub 1 of x, and multiply it with the divisor, divisor here and we get this remainder. So that's from the problem. And the problem also states that if we divide it by x squared, and again, there's a quotient, we don't know the quotient, but we have to put something there. Let's call it q sub two of x. If we divide it by x squared, we obtain a remainder of two x plus three. And lastly, we also know that because we are dividing, so, so the problem states that if we divide it by x squared times x minus 1, the remainder is ax squared plus bx plus c. So actually, this is not an additional statement from the problem. This is just a clarification by the problem because we know in advance that if we are dividing by x squared times x minus 1, the remainder must necessarily be of the order two and the reason for that is because here we have x squared here we have x so the the degree of this divisor is three and the remainder can only be of a degree less than the degree of that divisor and so the maximum degree for our remainder would be squared and the problem is kind enough to actually state that that this is our remainder and again we have a quotient, which we do not know, let's call it the capital Q of X, the function capital Q of X, and this is the remainder. Okay, this is the general form of the remainder, and we just need to find the coefficients A, B, and C. Here we just write down what we had written in the previous slide, and now we start thinking about what we can do with this, and we base our thought on the remainder theorem. And if you recall, the remainder theorem allows us to do some substitutions. So that's what we'll do here. So first, let's think about the first condition here. Now, if we substitute 1 for x, this term here will vanish, right? Because it's 1 minus 1. And so if we do that, we have f of 1, substitute 1. Then here we have q of q sub 1 of 1. And this bit here becomes 1 minus 1 squared and that will vanish this bit will become zero right and then here we have one plus one that's x plus one becomes one plus one and so we have two now we know that f of one is two now we do the same thing for the second condition here now we set x to zero because that way this bit will be set to zero and again we have this whole expression here reducing to zero. 
And now we know that f of 0 equals 2 times 0 plus 3. That's 2x plus 3. And that's equal to 3 in here. Now let's do something with the third condition here. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to try to regroup the terms so that it matches the second equation here. And what we mean by that is the following. We see that in equation 2, the remainder is a linear polynomial. So we have a 2x plus 3. And x squared is a factor of the, co of the, of the first part. That is the quotient times x squared plus the remainder. And we want to make equation 3 into that form. And so what we did is we moved ax squared to be grouped with the first part of this equation. And that is just putting a here and factoring x squared. That's not really very complicated. But that's very important because now we know that all the terms that are x squared and and with degree 2 and greater, that means x squared and above, x cubed, x to the fourth, x to the fifth, they would all be contained in this term, right? Because this is a polynomial here. So this cannot have any x's or expressions of x in the denominator. All the expressions of x will be in the numerator. So this is a polynomial. And so we know that this term, the first part, will have a degree of 2 or greater. And that's the same case for this equation in 2. And what that means is that this equation, or rather this expression here, should match exactly this, this expression here for any value of x. And I repeat that, any value of x. And that's very important because the only way that it can match any value of x is for the coefficients to be the same. That means the 2x plus 3 here must be exactly the same. The coefficients here must be exactly the same as bx plus c here. And so now we can say that c equals 3 and b equals 2. And we write that down this way. Now we can see how we are going to find a. We simply have to set this to 1 and so that this bit vanishes to 0. And so let's substitute 1 for x. We do that, so f of 1 here, and then this bit here vanishes to 0 because this is 0. And now we're left with a, and then here x squared just becomes 1, bx becomes 2 times 1, and c is just 3. And now if we if we simplify that a bit, we get f of 1 equals a, so that's from here, times 1, so that's just a, plus 5. 5 came from, comes from 2 times 1 plus 3. So a plus 5 equals 2. Where do we get the 2? It's from this equation here, f of 1 equals 2. That's, that's why we say it's because of equation 1. That's what we mean by this. And now we can solve this very easily. And the solution to that is just a equals negative 3. The problem reads, the angle theta, where theta is greater than 0 and less than pi over 2, between the two lines y equals 2 minus square root of 3x and y equals square root of 3 minus 2x, on the xy plane is blank. There are three key ideas that might be useful in the solution. First is that the idea that the slope of a line on the xy plane is equal to the tangent of the angle that the line makes with the x-axis. The second is that the tangent of 2 times an angle equals 2 times the tangent of the angle over 1 minus the tangent of the angle squared. So this is an identity that's 
easily proven in trigonometry. And lastly, we will need the following triangle. This is a special triangle, a 30, 60, 90 triangle. And we will have to recall that if this angle here is 30 degrees or pi over 6, then the ratio of the sides of the triangle is such that the opposite, the opposite side is 1 and the, the adjacent side would be square root of 3. And of course, the long side here would just be 2. For our convenience, let us define a few variables. So this is the given line, the first line in the given. Let's call that line L1. And let's call it slope. This is the slope. Let's call that M sub 1. And we know that that is the tangent of the angle that it makes with the positive x-axis. And let's call that angle that it makes with a positive x-axis, let's call that theta sub 1. And for the second line, let's call that line L sub 2. And the angle that it makes with a positive x-axis, let's call that theta 2. And so we also call the slope of this line, this bit, to be M sub 2. Now let's just write down the angles or rather the slopes, m sub 1 and m sub 2. So m sub 1 is just this expression from here. m sub 2 is just this from here. And we notice that m sub 1 and m sub 2 are negatives of each other. And the significance of that is that they, the angles that they make, the angles that they make with the positive x-axis are actually negatives of each other and so we can say that theta 2 is actually equal to the negative of theta 1. If we draw that this is what we mean so this is just a sketch so the angles you see the angle here is a bit smaller than this but actually we don't know that yet because this is just a a sketch this is not drawn to scale think of it as not drawn to scale. Now we drew L1 to be the green line here and L2 to be the blue line. The reason for that is L1 has a slope of m sub 1 and we know that m sub 1 is positive. That's why the line is increasing like this. And the reason that it is positive is because 2 minus square root of 3 is positive. 2 is greater than the square root of 3. And to make that even clearer, think of the square of 2 which is 4 and the square of 3 which is just square of the square of square root of 3 which is just 3 so 4 is greater than 3 so 4 minus 3 is positive and so 2 minus the square root of 3 is also positive so we have that line and then we saw that m sub 2 is just the negative of m sub 1 and so that line is decreasing it looks like this and theta 1 is the angle that L1 makes with the positive x-axis. And so this is theta 1 here. And theta 2 is just the negative of theta 1. And so it's this angle here. And so now we know what we're looking for. We're looking for the difference between the angles that these lines make with the x-axis or the difference here. So we're just looking for the angle between the two lines, okay? And it could be this angle or it could be this angle. So we're looking for the smaller of theta 1 minus theta 2. So theta 1 is this, this here, and theta 2 is this one. So from here to here, this is theta 2. So theta 1 minus theta 2 is just theta 1 minus the negative of theta 1 because we know that theta 2, theta 2 here is just negative theta 1 here. So we're looking for 2 theta 1. That's this angle. Or we could be looking for the other, for the other angle, which is just pi minus 
minus this angle here so pi minus 2 theta 1 and the reason we do not know yet is because we we are we, are, we have not drawn this to scale and the condition for the angle that we're looking for is simply zero is less than that angle which should be less than pi over two and we cannot say that from from what we have here right now so here we just rewrite what we already know we we have rewritten the slopes and the relationships and this is the triangle that we might need to solve and we see that this is what we're looking for or this whichever is smaller smaller because we want it to be less than pi over 2 or 90 degrees so what we can do because we know we now know this value or we're, we're looking for this value and we have tangent of those values tangent of this is this the tangent of this is simply that so we can use the tangent function in particular this identity that the tangent of this of this angle here is two times the tangent of this angle over one minus the square of the tangent of that angle and we use this because we know this and this sorry this tangent here right this is the value of that so we replace this with the value 2 minus square root of 3 and we replace that and we get this so in the numerator we replace that here in the denominator we replace that here and then we get this and then we just try to expand the denominator first so 1 minus this expression here then we simplify that the denominator becomes this is 1 minus 4 plus 3 which is 7 so 1 minus 7 is negative 6 and then minus minus 4 square root of 3 so that's positive 4 square root of 3 and you can see you can factor 2 out of the denominator that's what we did here so the twos cancel and we now have to rationalize this expression that means we'll have to multiply both the numerator and the denominator by the conjugate of the denominator and that's what we do here the conjugate of this expression is this so we just change the plus to minus and when we do the multiplication in the numerator and denominator we see this expression in the numerator and this in the denominator the denominator is simply the square of the first term minus the square of the second and now we can see that the negative 6 here cancels with the 6 here and the negative 4 square root of 3 plus 3 square root of 3 becomes just negative square root of 3 and this 9 minus 12 becomes just minus 3 and so we get this as a simplified answer which we can also write as 1 over square root of 3 and we notice and this is actually what we're looking for from the very beginning we're looking for the, the tangent of 2 times the theta times theta sub 1 and we just write it here and we notice that this is a special angle this 2 theta sub 1 because this is a special value and that, that is from this from this triangle if you have pi over 6 here then the tangent of this is just this over this and so we conclude that 2 theta sub 1 is equal to pi over 6 and we're looking for the smaller between this and this so what is pi minus pi over 6 then that's just 5 pi over 6 so this expression is 5 pi over 6 and that's bigger and so what we're looking for is this one pi over 6 we cast a die three times let a b and c be the number of dots 
on a side of the die in order. Now we have to answer the questions based on this given situation. For this video, we're going to answer question one. What is the probability P sub one that there exists a triangle with the side lengths square root of A, square root of B, and square root of C? Let us now review some key ideas that may be helpful in solving this problem. First is the triangle. So here we just made a general triangle. It's not drawn to scale. And then we label each side square root of A, square root of B, square root of C. The label can go anywhere. In my case, I just labeled it this way. And now we want to think about when a triangle is possible and when it is not possible to have a triangle given this side, these side lengths. And the key theorem that we have is the triangle inequality. It tells us that for any triangle, for any triangle, these inequalities must hold. All it says is that if you add two sides, any two sides of the triangle, that must be greater than the third side. So here, if we add this side and this side, the result must be greater than the third side. Same, the same is the case if we add this side and this side, so that's here, it must be greater than the third side. And if we add the other two combinations, this one, the other, sorry, the last combination, this one and this one, it must be greater than the third side. So that's one key theorem that we need to remember. The other is that the definition of the probability. So when, what is the probability of having a triangle formed in the situation that was given in the problem? So we say that the probability of that happening is the number of possibilities, the number of ways that a triangle can form over the number of all possible outcomes. So here, the outcomes would be the combination or the, the numbers, the combination of the numbers in the die. So when we throw it three times, the combination of the result of the first throw, the second throw, and the third throw. So how many combinations are there? How many, how many of those are there that comes here? And on top of that, out of all those combinations, which, which of those actually form a triangle? And that's going to come in the numerator. So let's just write down what we're looking for, and that's the probability of the outcomes, the square root of the outcomes, forming a, the sides of a triangle. So we're looking for the number of all possible outcomes. And we also are looking for how many of those outcomes actually form the triangle as specified in the problem. So the denominator is easier to compute. So we, let's start with that. The number of all possible outcomes can be found by thinking as follows. In the first throw, there are six possible outcomes because there are six faces of the die. For each of those outcomes, we throw a second time. And again, there are six possible outcomes for the second throw. And so for the first and second throws, there are six times six or 36 possible combinations of outcomes. And for each of those 36 combinations, we throw a third die. And the third die, again, has six possible outcomes. So all in all, for the three throws, there are six times six times six, or 216 combinations of possible outcomes, or combinations of outcomes. And so that goes in our denominator. Now we're left with the numerator. So how do we think about how many of those outcomes actually form a triangle as specified in the problem. Now let's think about what forms a triangle. 
So this leads us to the triangle inequality. A triangle forms if and only if the sum of two sides is greater than the third side. And in the problem, that means that if we have the sides square root of a, square root of b, and square root of c, and if square root of a is the largest among the three, then the square root of a must be less than the sum of square root of b and square root of c. So this is the triangle inequality. So a triangle forms if and only if this is satisfied. And just to make it easier for us to work with, let's work with a form of this without the square root, or at least with fewer square root symbols. So what we do is we square both sides. So we get a here, and on the right side, we get b plus c plus two square root of bc. And now let's just write that down again like this. So a, and then here b plus c plus square plus two square root of bc. So this must be satisfied if we have a triangle that forms. And the other way of saying this, an equivalent formulation, is that a triangle does not form if and only if, well, we flip, we flip this symbol. If the square root of a is greater than or equal to the sum of square root of b and square root of c. And again, just to remove the square root, we square both sides and we are left with the following inequality. So a is greater than or equal to b plus c plus 2 square root of bc. So if, the, if this inequality is satisfied, then we have a triangle. If this inequality is satisfied, then we do not have a triangle. And so the next step is to actually look at the possible outcomes and see if a triangle forms or not. And we start with the worst case scenario. So if you look at this, what is the worst case for a triangle to form, right? So that would be when this inequality is violated. And the worst possible case is when the sum here of b of square root of b and square root of c is very small, right? Because if we have a very small sum here, then it's more likely that a will be greater than that sum. So let's try to use the the worst case scenario meaning the smallest possible values of b and c and we'll do that first and the smallest possible value will of course be when b is one and c is one and let's write that in a table so here i just rewrote what we what we learned in the previous slide and just put a few colors there just to make it easier for us to read now here's going to be our table so we start with the worst case scenario that's b is one and c is one and that's the worst possible case for a triangle to form okay if we have greater values there that's better and there will be more triangles that form and so for the worst case b plus c will just be one plus one two two square root of bc will just be two times one times one so two times one is just two and if you add b plus c plus 2 square root of bc, that's because we, we want this bit here. So we get 2 plus 2, we get 4. And if we have 4 on this side of the equation here, if we have 4 here, then what are the possible values of a? So we just need values that are less than 4, right? And the die could give us 1, 2, or 3 for that because the, de the die could have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, or, or 6. But out of those 6 outcomes, only if the die gives us 1, 2, or 3 do we have a triangle when we have B and C as 1, 1, right? Because here would be 4, and 4 must be greater than A, and so A could only be 1, 2, or 3. And of course, that means that the remaining possible values, 4, 5, and 6, would give us no 
triangle. All right. Now, let's go to the next worst scenario for a triangle to form. So we've done one one. Now let's go just increase it a little bit. And so let's do where C is two and B is one. So that's one two here. Or if we switch them, that's equivalent because we're doing sums and products here. So two one, they're the same. And so we have B plus C, we have three. The square root of BC is two times one. So square root of two, and then we multiply it by two, two square root of two. And so the sum of that is three plus two square root of two. And we know that this is greater than five because square root of two is greater than one, right? So we had this one, so we had three plus two is five, but square root of two is greater than one. So we have something that is three times two, three plus two times something that is greater than one. So that should be greater than five. And if this value here is greater than five, then what possible values of A could we have for a triangle to form? Then any values between one and five would work, right? Because if this is five here, five here, then A could be one, two, three, four, five, because they are all smaller than five. Sorry, B plus C plus two plus square root of BC is actually not five. It's greater than five, right? And so anything below anything below five five and below would work and that's why we have it here and of course the remaining value six would not give us a triangle right so this is what it means now it looks like we're, we're having fewer and fewer non-triangles here so the next bad value or the next worst possible combination for a triangle to form is we just again add just one so we have one here maybe three so one three and that's equivalent to just three one here and again we get the sum that's four two square root of bc is just two square root of three times one which is three here and again we have four plus two square root of three and we know that this is greater than six so if this is greater than we know that this is greater than six because square root of three the square root of three is greater than one. So that's four plus two times something greater than one is of course greater than four plus two times one, which is six. And that means that this bit here is six or rather greater than six. So if this is greater than six, then what are the possible values of A? So anything that is six and below would work for this because we already have six here, or rather greater than six here, right? So one to six would work. And so none of the no, none of these values wouldn't work. All of them would work. So there's no point now, there's no point checking the next uh, worst case, which is one four, because we now know that everything works for one three. So just going up, just, just incrementing up would always work now right because now we've we've checked the worst possible cases all the other cases one four one five one six would be much better than this case and so they will always have a triangle that will form okay so we don't have to check them now we know that everything will form the triangle now we just have to check but let's now go to the next bit because here we've we've been checking combinations that start with one. Now let's start with two. So two, two. Now again, two, two, two plus two is four. And the square root of BC times two, which is before, so four plus four is eight. Now again, that's gr if, if we have an eight here, then anything for A would work because A could only be one, two, three, four, five, or six. So again, two, two is, is, is something that will give you any that will give any possible value of a a triangle right so again there's no point checking anything larger than two two so we don't even check two three we don't even check three two three three or anything greater because again these are the we, we started with the worst so anything after them would be much better in terms of the triangles that they form 
So now it looks like we can actually start counting. And we observe that actually we have fewer non-triangles. So maybe it's better if we count the non-triangles and subtract it from the number from the total number of outcomes. And that's what we will do next. So here I just rewrote the table so that uh, we get rid of the of the intermediate computations. Now here we're just going to count. So here the possible values for 1 1 for example is just 1 2 and 3 for A and the the non triangles would be if we have 4 5 and 6. And now let's count how many of those actually are possible. So for example, if we have a combination 1 1 and 4 we actually have three possible ways of having this because we can have 1 1 4, we can have 1 4 1, we can have 4 1 1. So that's why we have three here. And the same is the case for five and six. And so we have three, three, and three here. Now for one, two, and six, so we have one, two, and six. So how many permutations do we have for, for this bit here? So we have three factorial per, per, permutations. And so three factorial is six. So that's it. We just have to add them all together. And in fact, when we add them, we have 9 here plus 6, 5, rather 6, 15. And so we have the number of non triangles is 15. And so the number of triangles, possible triangles, would be 216 minus 15, which is 201. And then now we have something to put in the numerator, which is 201. And so we obtain the following probability. 201 over 216, or if we divide the numerator and the denominator by 3, we get 67 over 72. Given that there exists a right triangle with the side lengths square root of a, square root of b, square root of c, what is the conditional probability p sub 2 that a, b, c are mutually different? There are two key ideas that we need to recall to solve this problem. The first is that for a right triangle, the square of the hypotenuse is equal to the sum of the squares of the two other sides. So if the hypotenuse is, is the side with the length square root of a, then a must be equal to b plus c. And it's also the case that if A equals B plus C, then it is a right triangle. So this is just from the Pythagorean theorem. It says that a right triangle, it is a right triangle if and only if this identity, this relationship among the sides holds. The second key idea is the idea of conditional probability. We are looking for the conditional probability p sub 2. And it says that if we, if we know in advance that the triangle is a right triangle, what is the probability that it is a scaling triangle? So what we're actually being asked is that what is the probability that we get a right triangle and a scaling triangle? So the triangle that we get is both a right triangle and a scaling triangle, given that we already know that it's a right triangle. So the, the way we compute that is we count the number of possibilities, the number of, of ways where we could get a right and scaling triangle, so a triangle that is both right and scaling, and then we divide that by the number of ways of how we can get a right triangle, whether scaling or not. So again, the numerator is the number of ways that the triangle is both right and scaling, and the denominator is just the number of ways that we get a right triangle. So that's conditional probability. So let's just remind ourselves that we're looking for p sub 2. And so we want to count the numerator, the number of triangles 
that are both right and scalene and we also want to count the number of triangles that are right regardless of whether or not it's scalene and we will start with the denominator because that's easier so we recall from the previous slide that a right triangle it is a right triangle if and only if a equals b plus c so we will look at all the possibilities all the combinations of die outcomes such that a equals b plus c of course we could also have b equals a plus c and c equals a plus b but if if we do it in a manner if we count it in the manner that we will do here we can see that we can easily do that permutation using the counting techniques and we only have to consider a equals b plus c so let's start with that so here i have a table and you can look at this table as actually two tables so the first four columns here is actually it's actually the same as the second four columns here it's just that the combinations here are different from here so this is just the same space the first column is a combination of b and c and the second column is for those b and c what is the a the value of a the third column is actually whether it's scalene or not because we th that will be used later for the numerator but it's helpful to just put it in our table right off the bat and the fourth column is just counting the number of right triangles so this fourth column will count all the right triangles that that fit this criteria and the permutations here so now we will start listing all the right triangles and again all right triangles would satisfy this criterion here a equals b plus c so let's start with b and c so b and c suppose they are both one what would be a to make it a right triangle so that's one plus one two and is this a scalene triangle and this is not a scalene triangle let's remind ourselves that a scalene triangle is a triangle where all three sides are different they have different lengths in this case b and c have the same lengths so this is not a scalene triangle but still it's a right triangle and if you look at this we can actually instead of having one one two we could have two one one or one two one and if we recall how we count that we count that by doing three factorial that's how many sides over how many sides repeat so there are two sides that repeat so three factorial over two factorial that's three and that also makes sense because we could have one one two one two one and two one one and again that's just three possibilities so that covers all the permutations for b c and a with these sides now let's move to the next possible right triangle so the way we do that is just we just increment one of the sides let's say we increment c from one to two so one two and then we also list the reverse so two one for because both of these will have one plus two or two plus one will have the same a which is three in this case now are these cases scalene triangles clearly yes because that's one two and three they are all different and how many scalene triangles can we form with the with the numbers one two three with the lengths one two three or rather square of the lengths one two and three and again that's just the permutation of the of 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 these um, elements so that's three factorial over how many repeating elements no repeating elements of so zero factorial which is just one so three factorial is just six and now that covers all the possibilities for when any of the so any of the sides would have a square of one two and three now let's proceed to the next possible right triangle again we just do an increment so now let's do two let's do c equals two to c equals three and we again write the reverse of that which is just three one here because for both these cases a would have to be three plus one or one plus three which is four again are these combinations scalene and yes because one three and four are all different and 
In the same manner, we can count the number of permutations. We just say three factorial, and that will be six again. Then we do that for the next possible right triangle. That is, we again increment three to four. One plus four or four plus one is just five for A. And again, this is scalene, and there are six of those permutations again. And then we do that again for the next possible right triangle. So four plus one is five, so one five or five one. Five plus one or one plus five here, we get a six for A. Again, this is scalene. These are scalene triangles, and there are six permutations. Now, we cannot increment further. We cannot go from five to six, because if we go from five to six, then one plus six would be seven. So A would have to be seven. And the maximum value for A is only six, because uh, again, A is just the number of dots on a side of the die. So these are all the possible combinations we have for when B equals one. So we now increment B from one to two. So here we do B equals two. Now C, would, we'd want to start at C equals one, but we've already covered it here. So actually we only have to start, we, we need to start at C equals two. Now two, 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 what would be A? That would be four. And is this scalene? No, this isn't because two and two are equal. So not all three sides are different. So this is not scalene. And again, there are three permutations given these repeating values here, repeating values here. So we compute it in the same way here in three. Now we increment two to three and we again write down three, five. And if we have these values for B and C, a would be 2 plus 3, so we get a 5 here. And so if if that's the case, then we have 2, 3, and 5, which, it, which are all scalene triangles. The combinations, the permutations of those would still give you a scalene triangle or scalene triangles. And so we, we mark it with a circle here. And again, we can count them using this formula three factorial and we have six then we increment three to four two four it's pretty much the same process we just write again four two and two plus four or four plus two a would have to be six and again two four and six are all different numbers so we have a scalene triangle for that combination and there are six of them now we cannot go from 4 to 5 because 2 plus 5 would be 7. A would have to be 7. And so we do not consider any more increments for C. So we increment B. And when we increment B, we have B equals 3. And then if we start with C equals 1, that's already covered. 3, 1 is here. So 3 equals 2, that's also covered. 3, 2 over here. So we start with 3, 3. 3, 3, 3 plus 3, then A would have to be 6. And again, this is a right triangle because it, it satisfies this, but it's not scaling because 3 and 3 are equal. And again, there are three of those. Now, this would be the last combination that we'd have to consider because if we go further, let's say we increment from 3 to 4, then again, that would be 7. 3 plus 4 is 7, so again, that's not something we need to consider. So if we increment B to 4, then we're going to start with 4, 3, because we already considered 4, 1, and 4, 2. We considered 4, 2 here, yeah? So we, we're going to start with 4, 3, but again, 4, 3 is just the reverse of 3, 4, so that's 7. And we will, and it, it's quite clear that if we go even higher, the sum of B and C will even be greater than 6. So we actually can stop here, 3, 3, right at the middle. Now all we need to do is just count, add all the right scaling triangles, add the, add the counts, and divide it by the total number of right triangles. So the number of right triangles is just 
all of these. So 3 plus 6 plus 6 plus 6 plus 6. So that's actually 6. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. 6 times 6 is 36 plus 3 is 39, 42, 45. So there are 45 right triangles. And then we count the number of scalene triangles. So actually it might be easier to count the number of non-scalene triangles, which is 3, 3, 3, 9. So 45 minus 9, you have 36 scalene triangles. Therefore, the conditional probability that we're looking for is 36, which is the number of right scalene triangles, over 45, which is the number of right triangles. Or if you reduce that into lowest terms, divide by 9, divide by 9, that's 4 over 5. When there exists a triangle with the lengths square root of A, square root of B, square root of C, and one of the angles is 60 degrees, what is M, which is the maximum value of BC over A? Again, let us review some of the key ideas that will help us solve this problem. First is the kinds of triangles that we can get with the condition that at least one of the angles is 60 degrees. So the problem states that we're looking at triangles where one of the angles is 60 degrees. So there could be three types of triangles based on the angles. First is the scalene triangle, which means that all three angles in the triangle have, di have different measures. So A, B, and C will have different measures, different angles. And that also means that the lengths square root of A, square root of B, and square root of C are also different. So no two sides are the same. No two angles are the same. That's a scaling triangle. So in this case, we only have one 60 degree angle, either A, B, or C. So only one of them, and the others will be other angles and, and all of them will be different from each other. So that's the first case. The other case is the isosceles triangle, where at least two of the angles are equal. That also means that at least two sides of the triangle are of the same length. So for example, if we have A and C to be equal, then A would be, in this case, 60, and C would be 60. What would be B? And interestingly, in this case, if we have 60 degrees for both sides, then the third side would be 180 minus 60 minus 60. So that's 180 minus 120. And so we're left with B that is 60 degrees. That is also 60 degrees. That means that if two of the sides are equal to 60 degrees, then all of the, or rather, if two of the angles are equal to 60 degrees, then all of the angles, the remaining angle, is also 60 degrees, which is the third type of triangle that we're talking, that we're looking at, that we could be looking at, which is called an equilateral triangle. So an equilateral triangle, triangle is actually an isosceles triangle because it has at least two sides that are equal or two angles that are equal and in the case when the angle the two angles the two equal angles are 60 degrees then actually the third angle would also be 60 degrees and so we will have three angles that are equal and so three sides that are that are equal and so in this case it's equilateral so it's when we have a 60 degree triangle, or at least a triangle with two 60 degree angles, we actually have an equilateral triangle there. And again, that's a 60, 60, 60 degree triangle in that case. Then we also remember that if you have a triangle, the largest side would be opposite the largest angle. So the larger sides would be opposite the larger angles. The smallest side 
the shortest side will be opposite the shortest angle. And so in, a, in an equilateral triangle, because all angles and or rather all sides are of the same length, then all angles opposite those sides are also the same measure. Then we can say that the maximum of BC over A, which is which is what the problem is looking for, this happens when A is opposite the smallest angle. And that's because A is the length of the side. So we get a maximum here when A is smallest, right? And when B and C are larger, are, are largest. So A is smallest when it is opposite the smallest angle. And again, that follows directly from this second fact, this second idea that, that the larger sides are opposite the larger angles. And lastly, although we're looking for a maximum here, we notice that it might be hard to use regular calculus here because B, C, and A and the values involved are actually very restricted. They're not in a continuous distribution. They are integers in fact b c and a are integers so it's rather hard to use calculus if the values that we're looking at are integers so we will have to be doing listing and and carefully checking every possibility so here we just listed all the key ideas that, that we mentioned in the previous slide and let us also remember that we are looking for the value m, which is the maximum of the quantity bc over a. And to do this, we will have to list down all possibilities. And that may sound a lot, but actually, when we go through every possibility here in one, that would be fewer than we would have thought. So the easier bit is the isosceles triangles. So Let's start with that. If we're looking at the isosceles triangles with 60 degree angles, then again, we already mentioned that it will be an equilateral triangle. So A, suppose we have A to be 60 and B to be 60, then we know that C would also be 60. And we just wrote the computation here, 180 minus 60 plus 60 equals 60. So 180 is the total sum, is the sum of the angles in a triangle in the Euclidean, in, in Euclidean geometry. Then, because all the angles are equal, then we have an equilateral triangle. And so the sides would also be equal. The square root of A equals the square root of B equals the square root of C. So this would be how we draw it all the angles are equal and all the sides are equal and suppose let's just let's just use the variable a instead of b and c because well a is the first in the alphabet and also because the square root of each of these values are equal then if you square all sides and we also get a equals b equals c so again we'll we'll only need to use one of them now, if we try to solve B, B, C over A, so let's replace everything with A. So B equals A, so we replace B with A. C equals A, so we replace C with A. And so A times A over A is just A. Therefore, the value of M, that is the maximum of A, is just whatever is the possible the maximum possible value of a and because we have only six possible values of a that's because a is just the side of the die the number of dots on the side of the die so the possible values of a are only one two three four five and six so those integers and the maximum among those is just six and so we're done with the case for isosceles triangles now let's look at the case when we have scalene triangles. So because it's a scalene, because they are scalene triangles, only one of the angles are 60 degrees. 
or rather only one of the angles is 60 degrees and the others must be different they cannot be 60 and they cannot be equal to each other so let's call one of the other angles theta 1 and the remaining angle theta 2 if we know that the angles are 60 degrees and theta 1 then we could compute for theta 2 using the following relationship so the relation is that the sum of all the angles in a triangle is 180 and so if you have 60 plus theta 1 and theta 2 then we can compute for theta 2 you just move all these to the left and we get 120 minus theta 1 and then we can also assert that it is either the case that theta 1 is greater than 60 degrees or theta 2 is greater than 60 degrees but not both now why cannot they be equal so we already said that they can't be equal 60 degrees right because if one of them is equal to 60 degrees then they will become isosceles and in the case of 60 degrees an isosceles triangle is also an equilateral triangle and so they are not scaling so that already precludes the possibility of theta 1 or theta 2 being any of them being 60 degrees so it could only be one of them is greater and the other is less so if one of them is greater than 60 degrees let's say theta 1 then the other one should be less than 60 degrees and also vice versa that means if we have theta 2 to be greater than 60 degrees then theta 1 must be less than 60 degrees and that's easy to see if we think about it if we start with an equilateral triangle 60 60 60 then we don't want them to be the same then the only possibility is one of them should be either greater or less than 60 suppose it's greater then we already know that this is true right the second bullet point is true because we made it greater so b becomes greater however if we made it less than theta less than 60 so we will have let's say theta 1 to be less than 60 therefore theta 2 would be 120 minus something that is less than 60 and therefore 120 minus something less than 60 would actually be something greater than 60 right so we we take away some number from here because it starts with 60 and then we want to make it less let's say we take away some number alpha then that alpha would have to go somewhere it would have to go to this other angle here so that will be 60 plus alpha here if we have 60 minus alpha in here and so that shows that either theta 1 is greater than 60 degrees or theta 2 is greater than 60 degrees and that if theta 1 is greater than 60 then theta 2 must be less than 60 and the other way around if theta 1 is less than 60 then theta 2 must be greater than 60 so we now know that a could only be between could could only be chosen among between theta 1 and theta 2 because we've already said that a must be must be the smallest right so we also have to look for the smallest angle and the smallest angle is either theta 1 or theta 2 because one of them would be less than 60 so we can we can we can say that the angle opposite the side square root of a is actually the minimum of either theta 1 and theta 2 and if that's the case then theta then the angle this angle would not be the 60 degree angle and therefore the the side opposite the 60 degree angle could only be square root of c or square root of b but not square root of a right so in this case let's just say that the angle opposite the 60 degree angle is or rather the side opposite the 60 degree angle is the side square root of c in that case if we recall the cosine law then we have 
the square of this side of the side opposite the 60 degree angle equals the square of the other two sides the sum of the squares of the other two sides so that's the square of this plus the square of this minus two times the product of the other two sides so the product of this times this times the cosine of the angle opposite this side so the angle opposite this side is 60 so cosine of 60 which is conveniently one half cosine of 60 degrees is one half and so c equals a plus b minus square root of a b now we note that we can do this you can also have instead of, of c you can have b here now you just replace the b here with c right that's the case when instead of of having this to be square root of c you want this to be square root of b but it doesn't matter because if we look at here we're, we're looking at the product of b and c so actually if one of them is the side opposite the 60 degrees then the other is just the remaining side so you will still get the same product here so in our case let's just stick with this one uh, because this will make the variables only a and b so the first two letters in the alphabet continuing from the previous slide we now know that the expression that we're looking for which is bc over a we now know that we can substitute c with this expression here this is again obtained from the previous slide from the cosine law and looking at this expression we can actually add the restriction that the product ab must be a perfect square that is because c is an integer and a and b are also integers again let's recall that a b and c are just the number of dots on the face of a die so if c is an integer then these bits are also are al must also be integers this expression must be an integer so a is an integer b is an, is an integer therefore the square root of a b must also be an integer and the only way to make that an integer is to have the product of a and b to be a perfect square that means that we do not have to look at all the other possibilities we only have to look at the cases where the product a b is a perfect square so let's list down all those cases we start by listing down the, per the first six perfect squares and that's 1 4 9 16 25 and 36 and then we look for factors of each of the perfect squares and see if they can if they can match or satisfy the conditions given in the problem so for example the first perfect square one has factors one and one so only those two factors and therefore we do not have to consider this because one and one meaning a equals one and b equals one means that it is an isosceles triangle and here we're only looking at scaling triangles because we've already dealt with isosceles triangles in a previous slide so now we don't even have to look at this in this this case the next bit is when the product is four if the product is four then the possible factors are one four two and two now if we have two and two again that's a that's an isosceles triangle and so we don't have to tackle it here and if it's one four four one then that's what we actually need to look at so we leave it there for a moment and we move to the next perfect square which is nine so the factors of nine are one nine three and three again three and three is isosceles so we don't consider that and one and nine we also don't consider that why because nine is greater than six that means your b can never be nine and having the having understood that we will know that 16 25 and 36 they will have factors 16 25 and 36 but they will all be greater than six and so we don't have to consider those factors 
and then also we will not consider the the factors 4 4 for 16 5 5 4 for 25 and 6 6 for 36 because those are isosceles triangles and if we if we think about the other factors we have the only other factors would be here we have 8 2 again 8 is greater than 6 and here we have 6 and 6 is done and we have what else 12 and 3 again 12 is greater than 6 we also have 9 and 4 9 is greater than 6 so in fact this is the only case these are the only cases here that matter to us and so these are only two cases so we can actually compute the value of bc over a for each of these cases for example for the case when a equals 1 and b equals 4 then c would equal a plus b which is 1 plus 4 5 minus the square root of ab that's the square root of 4 2 so 5 minus 2 is just 3 okay and then we also know that this happens when a is opposite the smallest angle that means when a is the smallest side and in fact a is the smallest side for this case the first case not the second case so we actually only have to compute this case and that is b times c 4 times 3 12 over 1 so we have 12 and if you want to compute the other case for 4 1 here then we just have 1 times 3 over 4 and so we can add this to the possibilities that we're looking at we've we've already looked at isosceles and now we've looked at scaling triangles now that means that we only need to compare what we had earlier which is m equals 6 and m equals 12 which 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 is what we got from the scaling case and between 6 and 12 we can say that the maximum value is in fact 12. Let C be a curve given by the parametric equations x equals theta minus sine theta, y equals 1 minus cosine theta, where theta is greater than or equal to 0 and less than or equal to 2 pi. Now we just have to answer questions 1, 2, and 3. And here we will answer part 1, which is express the derivative of y with respect to x in terms of theta. This is a rather straightforward question. We just have to recall that if we have y, if we have the parametric equation expressed as y equals y of theta and x equals x of theta, then dy dx or the derivative of y with respect to x is simply the the quotient of the derivative of y with respect to theta over the derivative of x with respect to theta so we just want to look for dy dx and what we'll do is first we'll look for dy d theta and then we'll look for dx d theta and just get their quotient so if y of theta equals 1 minus cosine theta then dy d theta is is just this expression here the derivative of a constant is 0 the derivative of cosine theta is negative sine theta so 0 minus negative sine theta that's just sine theta for the derivative of x x of theta it's basically the same dx d theta is just so the derivative of theta is just one and the derivative of sine theta is cosine theta now we put these all together dy d theta over dx d theta so that's dy dx dy dx equals this expression sine theta over this expression one minus cosine theta and if you want to express it in a different way, then we can actually multiply the numerator and denominator by 1 plus cosine theta. That's just, that's just to make this denominator equal sine squared theta. Because you'll see that that will become 1 minus cosine squared theta, which is just equal to sine squared of theta. 
So sine theta over sine squared of theta is just sine theta. So the denominator is left to 1 plus cosine theta. And now these are your answers. And we are asked to find the area S of the figure A, which is bounded by C and the X axis. So the figure A is defined as the figure bounded by C, which is this curve, and bounded by the X axis. Let us list down a few items that might help us solve the problem. First is that the area S bounded by C and the X axis is actually the sum of the areas of the individual parts. So that's what this first part means. So this means that the area S, the total area S, is actually the sum of this area here. For example, this curve here is the, is the curve C. So the area S is the sum of the area here, the area here, and the area here. That's what this means. And you see S sub I is actually the area. That's the integral of Y with respect to X. So that's the area from X sub 1 to X sub 1 plus, rather X sub I to X sub I plus 1. So for example, for this area here, that's from X sub i to x sub i plus 1. So this is that s sub i here. And we see that we put absolute value symbols here because we want the positive area. So the area here should be positive, here should be positive, here should be positive. And we need that absolute value symbol because we know that if the curve falls below the x-axis, then the area there is negative. So if you just compute the integral, of this region here from x of theta i to x of theta i plus 1, then you're going to get a negative value. And we do not want to add that to the area. We, we want the positive areas to add up. So if it's negative, we need to get the absolute value. And, this is, and that's what this means here. We need to find the absolute values of the area. So it's, it's important that we know where the y becomes negative. If the y's are all positive, then we don't have a problem because it's just one whole big area. But if there are regions where the y, the y's are negative, then we need to find those. And lastly, okay, so this is just an illustration where the area is positive. This is when y is positive and the areas here are also positive. But down here we have y's that are negative, and so the area here, s sub i, are also negative. And lastly, we have Wally's formula. So this is an convenient formula. You don't really need this for this problem, but this is going to help our integration. It's going to make it quick. So Wally's formula says that the integral from 0 to pi over 2 of sine raised to the nth power d theta is equal to the integral of cosine raised to the nth power. So the important part here is the the important parts here are the limits of integration. It should be from 0 to pi over 2. Here it should be 0 to pi over 2. And then the exponents should be the same, n, n. Now if you have this, this can be easily evaluated using the following formula. So if n is even, if n is even, then all you need to do is attach a pi over 2 here at the end, and then you start by putting n in the denominator, then subtract 1, put it in the numerator, Subtract, an, subtract another one, put it in the denominator, subtract another one, put it in the numerator, and do this all the way to one half. And this product is the definite integral that we're looking for. Now, if n is odd, then we chuck in one here, and then the same thing, we just start with 
n in the denominator, subtract 1, put it in the numerator, subtract 1, put it in the denominator, subtract 1, put it in the numerator. Do it, do it again and again until you reach two thirds here. You see, after 2, you subtract 1, then it will be 1 in the denominator here. So it's pretty, it's pretty easy to remember this way. So this is going to make the integration a little bit easier for us. So let's just copy the key ideas that we had in the previous slide, put it here. And now we recall from, from this second idea here that if we have a curve that, if we have a part of the curve that is below the x-axis, then this area here will be negative. And we do not want to add a negative area. We want to, to get the absolute value of this. And so the first step in our process is to actually find the locations of the uh, on the curve where the y's are negative. So we want to find, if any, these regions in here. So let's find that. We, we will do that first. And then if there are y's that are below the x-axis, we will have to compute the areas separately. So we need to compute the area here, and then we need to compute the area here, and then we need to compute the area here. And we do them separately because, again, this will be negative. Here will be positive and positive. But we have to turn them all into positive. So we'll get the absolute values of all these. So let's do this. Let's first do looking for the values where y is uh, or y are negative. We start with the value for y, which is y of theta equals 1 minus cosine theta. And the problem states that the theta will be between 0 and 2 pi. If that is the case, then we start with trigonometry to see if this value of y if any of these values actually go below zero. So we're, that's what we're going to try to find out. So we start with trigonometry. We know from trigonometry that the value of cosine theta for any theta actually falls between negative one and one. Now, our goal is to, derive, is to arrive at this expression here from this starting point. So we want to get one minus cosine theta and see if that is ever less than zero. So we chuck in a negative sign here, and we do that by multiplying negative 1 to all sides of this, of this inequality. And when we do that, we obtain this. So the inequality symbols flip, and then we get a negative sign here. We lose the negative sign here. We get a negative sign here. And then we just add 1 on all sides. And now this is what we get. We get 1 plus 1, 1 minus cosine theta, 1 minus 1. So now we have this bit here, here, and we can replace it with y of theta. So we get 2 is greater than or equal to y of theta is greater than or equal to 0. What this tells us is that y of theta never falls below 0. So it's always positive, and in fact, it's always less than or equal to 2. And because we know this, now we do not even have to break the integral. So we do not have to worry about this because we now know that our y's are all positive. Everything falls above the x-axis. And so we just need to find the limits here now. So the limits here would be from the from where theta is 0, because that's the limit here, 0 to 2 pi. So that's what we'll do. And again, we, we've just said that we don't have to worry about this anymore, so we do not have to compute the area separately because y's, the y's here are all greater than or equal to zero. And so our integral is from x zero to x sub n. Again, x sub zero is just when theta equals zero and x sub n is just when theta is two pi. And we'll do that in the next slide. Now let's do the integral. Again, the area is given by this integral here. So here, x sub 0 is the leftmost point of the interval, and x sub n is the rightmost point of the interval. 
and we have to integrate y dx. And that will give us the area. Now, in our given, x sub 0 is actually 0. So it's the leftmost point of our interval. And x sub n is actually 2 pi. That's the rightmost point of our interval. And in fact, in this case, the, we are now looking at pi, or rather, uh, theta. So this is actually theta equals 0 is the leftmost point of our interval. And theta equals 2 pi is the rightmost part of our interval. And that's because we change variable from x to theta. The reason we change variables is because we are given in terms of theta. We are given functions in terms of theta. So it would be easier to actually do the integration in theta rather than in x. And the way we changed variables is for y, it's easy because we are given the values, the value of y already. So we just put there y of theta. And dx, we know how to get d theta from dx. And that's simply the derivative of x with respect to theta. That's dx d theta times the differential d theta. And so we replace this dx with this expression here. And that's what we get here. And now this whole integral is in terms of theta. And that's why our limits of integration are also in terms of theta. 0 to 2 pi. Now we replace y of theta with the expression that was given. We replace dx d theta with the expression that we solved for. And now we can continue the multiplication and we get this. And then we can separate the integral into three terms. And now here this bit is actually easy to integrate. This bit goes to 0. And this bit we can use Wallace formula. Now, I'll just remind ourselves why this goes to zero. That's because we're integrating from zero to two pi, and we're integrating a cosine function. And if you recall, if you have a cosine function, it will look something like this. Here would be two pi. Here it's maximum at one, and here it's maximum at one, and this is at zero. And what we know is that the area under this is positive because it's above y and here is also positive and here the area would be negative because it's below y y equals zero below the y-axis and actually the shape of this one is like one half the shape of this one and this is also this shape is also one half of the shape of this one and therefore if you add their areas the area of this one and this one would actually equal in magnitude to the area of this whole thing here. And so if you add them all together, you get a zero. And so this part of the integration would go to zero. Now the last term is very much like this. However, the upper limit of integration is 2 pi, and here we are given pi over 2. So let's convert this into an expression where we have a pi over 2 in the upper limit of integration. And this is actually what we get. We get four times this. The reason for that is if this is the the area for cosine of pi, if we square cosine of pi, meaning if you want to get cosine squared, what we do is we actually square we, we square each of the terms here. And and so this part of the area would be squared. So the maximum is still 1, so it remains there, but the shape will be altered. And then here at pi over 2, so this bit here is pi over 2 when it goes to 0. Instead of a negative area here, because it's squared, the square of a negative number is also a positive number. So it goes up, goes up like that. And here we have pi. And then the same is true with this other half. It also is above the y-axis. So now it looks like that. And also this bit here is just actually symmetric to the first bit. So just gonna look like that. And now because all these four areas actually have the same shape, the same area under them. And the reason for that is well, um, the sine curve is, or the cosine curve is actually symmetric with respect to, for example, in this case here, the, the middle, the middle point, the the crest, so to speak. So the the area here is same as here, as here, as here, and we also know that that is 
taken from 0 to pi over 2. And again, here is another pi over 2, pi over 2, and another pi over 2. And so we have 4 times the area here, which is given by this expression out here. And now we just need to apply Wally's formula. So 2 pi, then the 4 here goes here. Then for Wally's formula, we, we see that this is even, the exponent is even. So we start with the exponent here, which is 2. Then we subtract 1, we get 1. However, that is the last term here. So we've reached the last term, which is 1 half. And so the next term would be pi over 2. And we just do the arithmetic there, 2 pi plus 4 cancels with 2 and 2. So we get pi here and we get 3 pi. The last problem for this questionnaire requires us to find the volume V of the solid formed by rotation of A in 2, meaning this problem here, about the x-axis. This problem is rather straightforward. We just need to remember two things. First is the formula for the volume of revolution V about the x-axis. So if we recall, if we have an x, if we have the x-axis here and we have a curve above the x-axis, say the curve C, then the volume of revolution about the x-axis is, is, the, is the solid that is formed when we take this, this curve and we rotate it, we revolve it about the x-axis. And so if we start with that sheet, with that cross section, we'll end up with a, with a figure like this, which is symmetric with the x-axis and, and it's revolve around that. So it's like a cylinder, but the shape of the side is not really fixed. It, it, it varies with y. So if you look at this, this new figure that we have, if you want to get the volume of that, one way we can do that is we think of a strip. Let's say this strip here, and let's make it very thin. And it's so thin that we can call the, the height of that, the thickness of that as dx. And now this strip is, of course, the, the cross section there is like a circle. If you look at it from, from, this, from this side, what you'll see is you have a circle there, right? Because you revolved it around the x-axis. Now that circle will have a radius of y. That radius is the, is the height from the x-axis to the shape, to the curve C. So that's y. And, and when you revolve that, that becomes the radius of your circle, right? And so if you get the area of this disk, that's pi y squared. And if you want to get the volume of this disk, you have this area times this height or thickness, which is dx. And we do an integration that looks like this. Pi y squared, which is the area of this disk, times dx, the thickness of the disk. And we do that from the x at the end, we call it x sub o in this case, to the x at the end here, which we call x sub n in this case. So we just need to remember this. And the second thing is again Wallis formula. This is going to make the integration easier. So just to remind ourselves, it says that if we have the trigonometric functions sine and cosine, then if we have if we raise them to the nth power, we raise them to the nth power here like this, and we get their integral, the definite integral from 0 to pi over 2. Remember, the limits are important. So this only works if we take the integral from 0 to pi over 2. Then the value of that definite integral will be equal for when it's sine and when it's cosine. And they will also be equal to the values here. So if n is even, we just chuck in pi over 2 here. And then we multiply it with this with this with these terms here so we start with n which is even we subtract one that becomes numerator we subtract another one becomes a denominator and so on until you reach one half 
and if it if n is odd then what we have is we start with one instead of pi over two then we start again with n subtract one subtract one subtract one until we reach two thirds now all we need to do is integrate and we recall that the differential of x is equal to the derivative of x with respect to d theta to theta times the differential of theta so when we do the integration so again we know that this is the volume here but we need to replace it with theta instead of x because we are given the function in terms of theta so the limits of integration now become 0 to 2 pi because theta is between 0 to 2 pi according to the problem and pi here is retained then we have y of theta here then we just square that and then dx differential of x is just replaced with dx d theta times d theta now we just replace those functions with their values so y of theta is just 1 minus cosine theta and from the first part of problem 3 we know that dx d theta is 1 minus cosine theta so it's just the cube of this expression so 1 minus cosine of theta if you cube that we obtain the following we get 1 minus 3 cosine of theta plus 3 cosine squared theta minus the cube of cosine theta and now we just distribute the integral because that's going to make it easier for us the pi is a constant so it goes out now the integral of 1 is just theta and if you do that from 0 to 2 pi it's just 2 pi minus 0 so 2 pi is here now we get the integral of cosine theta and again we know that if we have a trigonometric function sine or cosine and if we try to get the the integral from 0 to the period and in this case the period is 2 pi so here what I've drawn is a sine function but can, if I start at the middle instead that will become a cosine function and we know that the area here is equal to the area here this is 0 2 pi and the sum of the area here and here is equal to this to this area here but because this area here is negative if you sum them all together that will be 0 and so we know that when we integrate this from 0 to 2 pi we get 0 and the same is true if we multi if you if you raise cosine to an odd power so for example we raise this to the third power this will still be positive here would still be negative here would be positive again but the shapes again the areas under the under them would still be equal this this and this and so when we do the integral here that's still gonna be zero but of course when the when the exponent is 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 even then this bit here gets for example in this case squared so it becomes positive it goes like that and again the area here is equal to one half this area here which is equal to this area here and equal to this area here so we can break that into four so this bit when we integrate this from zero to two pi we can actually break it into four integrals so we just copied the three here but now instead of integrating from zero to two pi which is for example from here to here you break that into four parts that's why there are four here and and each part is actually the same of the same area as the other parts and because there are two far two parts then that's from zero to pi over two so zero pi over two so this part is zero to pi over two and this bit here allow, allows us to use Wallace formula again and here that's what we did because this is even so we have pi over 2 from Wallace formula out here and then we start with the exponent 2 we subtract 1 put it in the numerator and this is already one half and so 
that that ends our process and then we just simplify the whole thing so we have pi we have 2 pi and this is 4 4 4 here cancel so 2 2 pi plus 3 pi and we just again simplify that and that gives us 5 pi squared